Have a good night. President Trump going on a Twitter tear, slamming critics of the Puerto Rico recovery effort and appearing to undercut his own Secretary of State on North Korea. I'm Rick Leventhal. You're watching The Fox Report. President Trump firing off nearly two dozen tweets this weekend, many of them directed at the mayor of San Juan, who said the administration was killing the people of Puerto Rico with inefficiency. The president vigorously defending the hurricane relief efforts there. And just moments ago, he took the time to acknowledge storm victims in Puerto Rico, as well as on the U.S. mainland, while presenting the President's Cup golf trophy to the American team in New Jersey. We have it under really great control, Puerto Rico, and the people of Florida who have really suffered over this last short period of time with the hurricanes. I want to just remember them, and we're going to dedicate this trophy to all of those people that went through so much that we love, a part of our great state, really a part of our great nation. Kristen Fisher has more on the White House response to Puerto Rico and North Korea. Hey, Rick, well, today President Trump is directly contradicting what his own Secretary of State said less than 24 hours ago, telling him to save his energy and that he's wasting his time trying to negotiate with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. He said on Twitter, quote, being nice to Rocket Man hasn't worked in 25 years. Why would it work now? Clinton failed, Bush failed, and Obama failed. I won't fail. So, you know, yesterday it appeared as though the diplomatic options had returned to the forefront for the Trump administration, but now it appears as though the pendulum has kind of swung back in the favor of military options, at least according to these latest tweets from President Trump. Now, the other thing that President Trump has been talking about today on Twitter is Puerto Rico. He is furious at what he describes as fake news and, quote, politically motivated ingrates who are criticizing his administration's response to the hurricane relief effort. So today, the administrator of FEMA was on Fox News Sunday to defend what's being done to help the millions of people still without power and supplies. It's not only a logistically complex event just getting to the islands and being able to support an island that was hit not just by one major hurricane, but two within basically a 10-day period. Um, the bottom line is, is you can only shove so much into an island pre-storm because if you push in too much stuff, the storm may damage it. But as President Trump attended the President's Cup golf tournament, Democrats are accusing him of playing too much golf and politics and not enough time on helping the people of Puerto Rico. The bottom line is, at least for the first week and a half, the effort has been uh, slow-footed, uh, disorganized and not adequate. And that's not just me saying it. Uh, General Buchanan said he doesn't have enough troops or material. And President Trump will be traveling to Puerto Rico on Tuesday to see for himself what the FEMA administrator is calling the most logistically challenging relief effort ever in U.S. history. Rick. Kristen Fisher, thank you. The governor of Puerto Rico says the recovery effort is kicking into high gear, with more than a million barrels of gasoline set to arrive over the next two days. Families need that fuel to run emergency generators. 95% of the island is still without power, and some areas could stay that way for months. Meanwhile, a top FEMA official appears to be siding with President Trump in his feud with Mayor Carmen Cruz. The mayor of San Juan has not participated uh, substantially in any efforts at the Joint Field Office. Now, that's where all three levels, uh, federal, uh, Commonwealth and the locals work together to develop plans, to execute those plans, and to deliver aid to those in need. Other mayors have been participating. They're connected to us either by satellite phone and far off uh, areas all around Puerto Rico, as well as being on site. Of course, Mayor Cruz has slammed the federal response, accusing the Trump administration of killing hurricane victims with inefficiency. Mike Tobin is reporting from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mike, any progress to report today? Well, Rick, you mentioned the uh, deliveries of fuel and diesel, and that has helped in terms of the gas line. But you're talking about gas lines that are now four hours long as opposed to nine hours long on previous days. The line at Sam's Club was three hours long. In fact, management routed it through the parking garage just so customers didn't have to wait out in the bru brutal heat so they could hoard all the things they need to get by. And, of course, all of it happens with cash. And that means people have to burn uh, precious gasoline to drive around until they find an ATM that that is open, stand in line, make a withdrawal, and that's just what you need to do to get the basics in life. It's worth it. It's worth it because you don't got no cash, you're not going to buy nothing around, 
and we're running out of supplies. A big problem over here is food supply. Gas is not a problem, but food, supermarkets are running out of food. You know, and I just went in food shop and, and there's nothing there. And it's just sad. Another sign of progress, flights have returned, commercial flights have returned to the International Airport here in San Juan. Rick? And Mike, what more do we know about the neighboring islands of Puerto Rico? Well, you know, we got our first look at the neighboring islands. Just off the east coast of the big island of Puerto Rico, you have Vieques and Culebra. And we got to look at it through the lens of cameraman Martin Jimenez, who got on a, a helicopter and got a tour of both of the islands. What we see is damage very similar to what we see in the big island. A lot of trees down, a lot of wind damage. On Vieques, the Red Cross says 150 homes have been destroyed. The good news is they know of no loss of life on either two of those islands related to the storm. In Culebra, residents tell us the damage there is mostly superficial, but the concern still goes back to power on the Big Island. That is because electricity comes from the Big Island. The clean water is rooted through, is pumped from uh, Puerto Rico, the Big Island, to Vieques, and then pumped to Culebra. So until power gets back to normal on the Big Island, life on the small islands won't return to normal. And we heard from the Army Corps of Engineers, it's going to be a while till we see the grid operating normally here. Mike Rick. Tobin in San Juan, Mike, thank you. He was one of the most famous inmates in the world, and now O.J. Simpson is a free man. The former star running back, acquitted of double murder in the trial of the century, was later convicted in a Las Vegas armed robbery case. He was released this morning after serving nine years in a Nevada prison. Simpson granted parole at a hearing in July, reportedly in Las Vegas now, but of course he said he'd like to return to his home in Florida. The attorney general there says he's not welcome. We've gone back, we've listened to that entire hearing, his laughing during the hearing, and we've also looked at his, um, other than his just complete lack of remorse, um, he wants to come to Florida and golf all over our state, and I don't want that to happen. Claudia Cowan is live in Reno, Nevada. Claudia, the uh, Nevada Department of Corrections seemed to scoop everyone on this. You know, that's right, Rick. They really did. Uh, prison officials here in Nevada were intent on thwarting the paparazzi and anyone else intent on pursuing Simpson uh, to get the so-called money shot of him driving away a chase that they knew could put the public possibly in danger. And so they kept the details of his release a closely guarded secret, and they took the first pictures of O.J. Simpson themselves. Uh, take a look. Here's a picture of Simpson signing some final paperwork. And then just a few minutes after midnight, they gave him the cue to walk out of prison. Come on out. Okay. He was whisked away in a black SUV, taking boxes of personal effects that had his name on it, including clothes and a hot plate, so that nobody could sell those items later on eBay. At his parole hearing in July, Simpson said he wanted to live in Florida, but prison officials there say they still haven't received any paperwork for his transfer. And as we just heard, Florida's Attorney General Pam Bondi is fighting to keep him out. Now, if he does end up there, Bondi is asking all Floridians to keep their cell phones handy, and if they happen to see O.J. Simpson uh, getting drunk or stepping out of line in any way to send pictures to her, presumably to use as evidence that he is violating the terms of his parole. Wow. Rick. I understand the family of Ron Goldman uh, weighed in today as well, Claudia. That's right, they did, Rick. You know, the Goldman said that they respect uh, the Nevada Parole Board's decision to release O.J. Simpson and that they knew this day was coming, but they did issue a statement today uh, saying that uh, it's still difficult knowing he will be a free man again. That's a quote. They also say they'll continue to pursue the $33 million judgment awarded in the civil trial, which found Simpson liable for the death of their son, Ron, and Simpson's ex-wife, Nicole Brown, a judgment that that because of accrued interest over all this time has grown to about $60 million. Rick. Claudia Cowan reporting live in Reno, Nevada. Claudia, thank you. Right now, ISIS claiming responsibility for a deadly knife attack at a train station in southern France. And in western Canada, another apparent terrorist attack. We have the latest developments on all of these incidents next on the Fox Report. It is believed at this time that these two incidents are related. It was determined that these incidents are being investigated as acts of terrorism under Section 83.2 of the Criminal Code.
A rash of violence outside the U.S. being investigated as terrorism. A knife-wielding man is accused of killing at least two women in southern France. And now ISIS says the attacker was one of their own. Meanwhile, another man is suspected in a pair of attacks in western Canada. Police releasing some of the chilling audio as officers made their desperate plea for help after a van plowed through a group of people. That incident injuring at least four. Anita Vogel is live now in Los Angeles with the details. Anita, what can you tell us about that attack in Canada? Well, hi there, Rick. We know exactly what happened because in addition to that audio tape, some of the attack was captured on surveillance tape. Take a look at this. A police officer was sent flying into the air when a car rammed through a barricade outside a Canadian League football game in Edmonton. Police say afterwards the driver got out of the car and began attacking the police officer with a knife before fleeing on foot. A few hours later, the suspect led police on a high-speed chase in a U-Haul and was intentionally trying to hit people walking by. Totally unexpected, uh, but uh, you know, he's got an entire police service and a community behind him, and uh, he's doing well, thankfully. It's important in these situations not to go, you know, for police not to be running, you know, all, all over the city, but to make sure they're actually doing things methodically, and that's what they're doing. Today, the White House put out this statement about the attack, quote, we condemn the cowardly terror attacks on a police officer and pedestrians that occurred late last night in Edmonton, Canada. Law enforcement authorities from the United States are in touch with their Canadian counterparts to offer assistance with the ongoing investigation. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims as we hope for their speedy and complete recovery. Now, the suspect is described as a man in his 30s who did appear on a police watch list. And Rick, he had an Islamic State flag in his car. And what Rick. more, Anita, do we know about those attacks in France? Oh, we know they happened this morning outside a train station in southern France in Marseille. Police say a man wielding a knife killed two women, stabbing one woman and slitting the other woman's throat. He was heard shouting Alu Akbar during the attack. God is great in Arabic. He was killed by French soldiers who were already patrolling the train station. Now, we don't know much about the suspect except that he had several identities. And late this afternoon, we know that ISIS did claim responsibility for that attack in France. Rick. Anita Vogel in Los Angeles. Anita, thank you. On Capitol Hill, Senate Republicans are feeling the heat on passing tax reform after failing to repeal and replace Obamacare for now. So can they get it done and give President Trump a major legislative victory? Plus, violent clashes breaking out between riot police and voters in Barcelona. Hundreds of people forcefully removed from polling stations the cause of this uproar ahead. If uh, there is a huge majority um, in, in favor of, of the independence uh, on, on this uh, sham voting, as I said, um, something that can be expected. Violence breaking out across the Catalonia region in northeastern Spain today. Several hundred people were injured in the confrontations with officers. Defiant voters attempted to take part in a banned referendum on independence from Madrid. Spain's Prime Minister, Mariano Rajoy, condemning local leaders for the chaos. This process has failed. It has only served to sow divisions, confront citizens, make trouble in the streets, and cause unwanted situations. It has only served to cause serious harm to coexistence. Coexistence is a good that we must begin to recover as soon as possible. Connor Powell has the latest. Rick, the referendum was controversial from the start, and as voters headed to the polls, it quickly turned violent, with hundreds injured. As Spanish police brutally tried to stop the voting, using rubber bullets and batons on crowds throughout the region. Barcelona's mayor now saying more than 460 people have been injured in clashes. Spain is divided into 17 autonomous regions of which Catalonia is one. Catalan's language and culture are distinct and different from the rest of Spain, and many in the region feel their culture is disappearing. Catalan already has a huge amount of autonomy, 
but a sizable part of the population there has regularly pushed for independence. A poll this summer showed about 41% favored independence, while 49 were against it. But the Spanish government in Madrid has gone out of its way to crack down on this referendum, seizing voting materials and detaining politicians, which has only inflamed passions. Barcelona's famed football team was supposed to have a game tonight. It went on, but Barca played in front of an empty stadium because of the violence. Rick? Connor Powell reporting from our Mideast Bureau. The Coast Guard releasing a damning report on the El Faro, a cargo ship that sank during Hurricane Joaquin back in 2015, killing all 33 people on board. The report pins most of the blame on the ship's captain, saying he misjudged the hurricane and overestimated the vessel's ability to weather the storm. The El Faro went down on October 1, 2015, in 15,000 feet of water near the Bahamas. Some NFL players defying President Trump taking a knee again during the national anthem. How these protests compare to last week when more than 200 players stirred controversy. Plus, Capitol Hill Republicans making the case for tax reform. But can they win over Democrats who say this is just a giveaway to the rich? The real details are this, is that we're looking at the middle class in terms of making sure they can pay less and, and this doesn't get nearly enough attention, it's easier for them to pay. The White House and congressional Republicans putting on a full court press for tax reform. And after their repeated failures to repeal and replace Obamacare, the stakes are high. The GOP says their plan will make businesses more competitive and help keep jobs in the U.S. On Fox News Sunday, Mick Mulvaney, the director of office management and budget, insisted the new rules would give the economy a shot in the arm. You're never going to get the type of tax reform and tax reductions that you need to get to sustained 3% economic growth. We really do believe that the tax code is what's holding back the American economy. Caroline Shively has more on this from Washington. So Caroline, is this a tax cut for the middle class or the wealthy or both or neither? It's both, Rick. The middle class saves some money, but a huge chunk of the savings actually go to the richest Americans. The administration was pushing the plan today, while Bernie Sanders is promising a fight. We are designing a tax plan for the United States of America. We, this is the federal tax plan. We are designing a tax plan to deliver middle income tax relief to America. This is the Robin Hood principle in reverse. Trump is taking from the middle class and working families in order to give huge tax breaks to the people on top. It is unacceptable, and we're going to fight it as hard as we can. So here's a sample for you, Rick. The nonpartisan tax policy center came up with a snapshot of the plan. The center says if your household is right in the middle, making between 48000 and 86000 the next year you'll get an average tax cut of $660. But if you make more than 730000 the top 1.5%, then you're set to save almost $130,000 in taxes. Now, that's a huge amount of money going to the wealthiest Americans, but they also pay the vast majority of taxes. The Treasury Department says that Last year, the top 10% of earners paid 80% of individual income taxes, but middle class tax cut sounds a whole lot better to voters. So that's the part that this administration seems to be pushing, Rick. So how confident is the White House that this will pass, Caroline? Uh, they seem pretty confident, but it is going to be tough. For one thing, this plan would block people from writing off property taxes, a saving that's popular in a lot of blue states like New York and California. The White House might also lose fellow Republicans over the cost. The Tax Policy Center and others estimate it could add more than $2 trillion to the deficit over 10 years. If it looks like to me, Chuck, we're adding one penny to the deficit, I am not going to be for it. Okay, I'm sorry. It is the greatest threat to our nation. A Senate committee is set to pass a draft budget resolution this week. The full Senate could move on it in a month. Rick? Caroline Shively, live in Washington. Caroline, thank you. Bet. Week four in the NFL, and once again, the play on the field is being overshadowed by some players defying President Trump, kneeling during the national anthem. Some stood but orchestrated other demonstrations, like linking arms or raising their fists. The display is coming a day after the president took to Twitter, urging the league to respect the flag. Brian Yenis has been keeping an eye on the sideline display. So, Brian, how did teams respond today? 
Hi, Rick. Well, look, the vast majority of players today throughout the NFL stood. There were some individuals who knelt, but this is by far the largest show of defiance that took place today. It was by the San Francisco 49ers. Half of the 49ers, that's about 30 players, kneeling during the national anthem in Arizona against the Cardinals. Fans booed. The 49ers released a statement on Twitter from the players, coaches, staff, and owners saying in part that they felt it was important as an NFL team to give voice to those who don't have a voice through freedom of expression. Quote, our gesture today was an intentional effort to demonstrate that. Make no mistake, we love this great country and have tremendous respect for our military and veterans who have sacrificed so much for our right to express ourselves freely. Now in Baltimore today, the Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers briefly took a knee before the national anthem to the sound of loud boos coming from the Baltimore crowd. Both teams then stood during the anthem. Now the New England Patriots and Carolina Panthers, they all stood at Foxborough. The Pats stood with their right hands over their hearts and left hands on their teammates' shoulders. Now across the pond in London, the Miami Dolphins play the New Orleans Saints. The Dolphins stood except for three players who kneeled. All three then stood for the rendition of God Save the Queen, though. The Saints knelt before the anthem and stood during it. President Trump tweeted last night about how important he, it is for players to stand during the anthem or earlier today. Running back Marshawn Lynch of the Raiders walked into the stadium tonight, Rick, wearing an everybody versus Trump shirt. Brian Yannis, thank you. Of course. So, Brian, real quick, uh, I don't know if you have spoken with the commissioner or if you have any word on how the commissioner, Roger Goodell, is responding to all of yeah, this. Yeah, Rick, this is an important point. CBS Sports is reporting that Commissioner Roger Goodell has been working to mobilize NFL players in their communities, and it's an initiative that was planned long before President Trump's comments two weeks ago. The league is reportedly looking for tangible ways where players can actually physically help their communities fight social justice, racism, and police brutality that extends far beyond just a financial contribution to the communities, Rick. Okay. Brian, thanks very of much. Course. For more on the anthem controversy, let's bring in Jim Gray, sportscaster and Fox News contributor. Jim, thanks for being with us again tonight. Good to see you, Rick. We spoke to you last week about the potential negative impact of these demonstrations and protests on the NFL. Are you seeing any evidence of that? Well, we've seen some evidence uh, just in terms of fans being upset. We've had some people burning jerseys. We've had uh, DirecTV offering refunds on their Sunday ticket. Uh, we have a report of the two major ticket uh, exchanges uh, seeing a downturn in people wanting to buy tickets. So uh, it's hard to say just exactly how much of this plays into it. Uh, the recent polls that came out this week, Rick, said 55% of the people did not like the guys kneeling and taking the social stand. And we hear the boos raining down from the, from the stands. They are raining down. Uh, the fans, you know, have basically uh, been watching this. Uh, it had died down considerably. Uh, two weeks ago, there were six guys. Last week, 250 after President Trump uh, tweeted. Uh, this week, the official numbers aren't in. It's much less than last week, but still, uh, the teams, the 49ers, as you just went through. And I think we're probably going to see a major demonstration by the Seattle Seahawks tonight uh, when they take on uh, Indianapolis uh, on Sunday Night Football. Jim, we saw some owners joining players on the field last week, but not today? I haven't heard of any owners down on the field today. Uh, and we certainly didn't see any of those owners down on the field. Uh, Fox uh, Broadcast Network decided not to show the anthems. I believe that they reported on uh, this, on who did not uh, uh, stand up. Uh, I was watching Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, and they did uh, note uh, in the Panthers and the Patriots game that everybody stood up. Uh, I did not see the other games that Fox broadcast, but they made a conscious decision uh, not to show the anthem. CBS did. Uh, so I'm not sure just exactly if there were any owners down on the field uh, during this time. Uh, but I haven't read any reports on the AP that there were. Jim, obviously the players who are taking a knee are doing it for a reason, uh, but I'm wondering whether that message has been lost in all of this. Well, I think we're seeing the message has changed. Originally it was Colin Kaepernick and he was upset uh, with the social injustice and, and the police shootings uh, of black men uh, around the country. Uh, he also wore uh, police uh, uh, depicted as pigs on his socks. Uh, so the original message uh, was that. 
uh, what this seems to have morphed into, particularly with most of the NFL players, uh, is a display of the social injustice, A, but also of unity to stop all of this division, to link arms and to try and come together as a society and, and as a country. Uh, I think what we will see now uh, is many of these owners and players, uh, as well as the commissioner's office, are trying to come together and take it from uh, this protest, uh, which is antagonizing people, uh, at least some of your clientele is antagonized by this, and now move this to having some significance and, and trying to take this into the communities where they can actually try and invoke some change. I wonder if there's been any maneuvering behind the scenes by owners to try and get the players to limit their protest moving forward. Well, I think it's, it, it depends on the city. Uh, obviously, in San Francisco, the owner is very much behind what his players did today because the organization has released that statement. Uh, so in some cities, uh, I'm sure that there are a number of things that are going on with the owners to try and, this is the wrong word, but to try and tamp this down or not to necessarily quell it, to allow them to have their individual freedoms and their freedom of speech, uh, but to let them know, hey, at the end of the day, this is a business. And the players share 50% of the football revenues in the National Football League. So it's not just the owners who are going to be damaged, but ultimately this will hit the salary cap. And if these revenues slide and you turn off the fans and the people are upset about this, you're going to have less fans, which means less revenue. And there could be less revenue for some players taking part in this in terms of fewer endorsement deals? Well, of course. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of companies who have said that we like people not standing for the national anthem. There are a number of companies who have said that they uh, certainly appreciate all of our freedoms, and one of those freedoms is the freedom of speech. Uh, how that plays out, uh, who, who ends up getting deals and endorsement deals, and who ends up getting canceled, I mean, we're just going to have to see what, this, what happens uh, over the long term. Uh, but in the short term, uh, nobody that I am aware of who has had a major endorsement deal has had it pulled. There may be some local deals that have been pulled, but uh, no major endorsement deals for the stand that you know, players Jim, have taken. Jim, as much as people may dislike the protests and mixing politics with football, it seems like people love football. And there are a lot of people who play fantasy football, too. So it struck me that perhaps if people weren't so involved in fantasy football and weren't so tied to this league to begin with in other ways, that maybe they would tune out more. But because of those things, it seems to me that People are going to keep watching. Any thoughts on that? But, Rick, why should, why, why should you have to choose? Why does this have to be in this circumstance? Can't you love your country? Can't you love football? Can't you love freedom of speech? Can't you love and honor the flag? I mean, why do these have to be mutually exclusive? Why does it have to be that fans and our country and people in all these cities now have to choose? It just seems to me that we can be on a track uh, where there can be social justice and where these issues can be solved or at least addressed and try and make progress as opposed to having to say, you know what, I'm never watching football again because of this. Well, then you have to choose. Do I love President Trump the most? Do I love football the most? Uh, do I love my team and my city and my community the most? Do I love the fact that they're pursuing social justice? I mean, that's the choice you have now, and it shouldn't be like that. This used to be a refuge. We used right. to have it in the military, and we used to have it in sports. We used to all come together, and now that's being frayed. And, and while there have been political protests in sports before, we haven't seen it on this level. Not by a league, and not in the unison that we had virtually all of last week. Uh, we've had those individual protests, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, 1968, of course, the entire life of Muhammad Ali. Uh, you go back to Jesse Owens, and we've had other instances, but never a league speaking in unison. And also the NBA uh, and its players uh, got involved last week when uh, President Trump uh, disinvited uh, the Warriors to the White House. Jim Gray, we appreciate your insight on this. Speaking of President Trump, he is arriving in Air Force One at Joint Base Andrews after sp spending the weekend in New Jersey. Obviously still on the plane, still taxiing. We will take you there live once the president departs. Air Force One. You think Madonna wants to find Madonna? You think she wakes up tomorrow morning going, I'm really hoping the next Madonna comes along and I need to do something about it. She's going, no, I want Madonna to be more successful. And I totally get that. So when I see them judging these shows, it's like, whoa. That's a big statement. That's true. What do you think of Katy Perry doing Idol? Good luck. So if you had the chance to sit down with Simon Cowell, what would you ask him? 
My next guest got the chance to do just that as part of his new show. It delves into the personal lives of celebrities, launching the conversation over an object the person holds close to their heart. Joining me now is Harvey Levin, executive producer of Objectified. Harvey, thanks for being with us. Hey, Rick. Before we get to Simon Cowell, a controversial American legend died this week. Do you have any personal stories on Hugh Hefner? Well, you know, it's funny. I saw him at a restaurant, um, gosh, three, four years ago. And I remember he was with, um, with two of the playmates. And, 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 and what really struck me about it was that Hugh Hefner charted his own path. And I think that's a hugely important thing that he did, which is chart his path when nobody was doing that um, for, you know, if for ever. Um, I think he's responsible for the sexual revolution. And when you look at what happened, especially back in the 60s, the sexual revolution, political awakening, civil rights, there was this confluence of events, and they all kind of merged at a point. And I think Hefner was a really important figure in American history, and especially in the 60s, when this country fundamentally changed. No doubt. Uh, Simon Cowell has been incredibly successful. He no doubt has a lot of toys. Will we be surprised at the object that sparked your interview? Well, yeah, I mean, I, th there, are, there are interesting objects for sure that, that he brings up. Um, one of them is a person, but you can't immediately tell it's a person. You will see when you watch the show. But um, he is very, very honest and, you know, conflicted. Because one of the things we talk about, you know, he, his, his child, Eric, is the love of his life now. But Eric was the product of an illicit affair where he was um, sleeping with one of his best friends wives and he talks about that and talks about you know if he you know he regrets what he did but on the other hand if he didn't do it he wouldn't have Eric and he really kind of gets into what makes Simon Cowell tick and the person that he is I think it's a real interesting hour well I think we have some of that why don't we listen to it so my favorite picture it's an ultrasound is that your son? Yeah, it's Eric. Wow. Is yeah. that the first one? Yeah. Do you uh, kind of mold him in your image? I think he was about two and a half. I sat him down one day and I said, I'm going to teach you three very, very important letters for when you get your first girlfriend. He was looking at me. I said, it's N D. A. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. so. A non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, he's ser Rick, he was serious. I checked it out. He really did do this with the kid. That's Lauren was furious. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. But you said you were surprised at his honesty. Are these celebrities typically not honest in these interviews? I mean, this was a new thing. For it's not that they're not honest. I think that th that when you allow them to kind of start things off on their turf with objects that mean something to them and they feel empowered by that, they open up more. And I think there are things that some of them have really not talked about before, but they feel more empowered to do it when they're doing it using these objects as kind of a gateway into, into periods of their lives. And I have found this with everybody that we've done this with, that there are things that really surprised me. And it's not that they were dishonest before, it's just that there's a level that you just haven't seen up to this point. That, that stuff about Madonna was, was pretty interesting, that, that someone who would be judging talent wouldn't want that talent to succeed too much because they might take the shine off the person who's judging them. That's exactly what he was saying. Exactly. Yeah. Um, does, does Simon like playing the villain? He doesn't view it as a, he doesn't view himself as a villain. Simon views himself as being honest. And, you know, and, and when you really watch him, and as, you know, especially when he gets brutal, it's brutal honesty. And, you know, he, he feels like the, he feels the people who are falsely complimentary, people who won't tell somebody you don't have the talent to pursue this career, he thinks they're the cruel ones because they're giving people false hope. So as Simon thinks his job is to lay it out on the table, and if somebody isn't right for that, he's doing them a favor by hammering it home. Did you get a sense of, of what drives him to keep doing what he does? Well, Rick, I will tell you, part of it is money and part of it is ego. And there is something in the last segment of the show, the object 
is unbelievable and it's something he has in his office and it's bigger than life and it's all about him and this guy has an ego like I have not seen in many people <laughs> and he's in he's not ashamed to talk about it well last week's show was terrific Harvey so we'll look forward to tonight's episode with Simon thank Cowell. you Rick thank you very thank you much. very much the Supreme Court is returning to work tomorrow facing a blockbuster docket on the agenda, objections to same-sex marriage, state regulation of sports betting, and much more. A preview of what to expect is just ahead.